So, Patty, every once in a while, I have a topic that I just really want to cover, and that's what happens. Passionate. Today. It's your pa- your passion, James. This is this is a, a segment, uh, an an episode where James really gets into his passion. We speak with Jonathan Razi from Cardex, which of course has just been acquired by Stacks. So we right. also t- speak with Sal from Cardex. And uh, why don't you give everybody a little taste of what they're going to hear? Yeah, you know, we talk about how to sell hard, not present merchants, compliant surcharging. And so mm-hmm. um, Sal, who's, uh, you know, uh, co-founder of Stacks uh, that just acquired uh, Cardex, they talk about this combination. And really what we dig into, though, is the mechanics of why should we sell compliant surcharging to card, not present merchants? Great, great information in there. They really shared some good insights, I feel like. Yeah, yeah. And then my insider's report, I talk about the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which, you know, was kind of like in the in the corners of of our periphery um, during the during the uh, Trump administration. But it's getting a lot more um, vocal now. And uh, there's definitely signs that it wants to regulate big tech, particularly big tech's forays into the payment space. And then, of course, James goes back to uh, his uh, most passionate topic, which is uh, it is questions from the field. Uh, you want to give everybody a little taste of that, James? Sure. Yeah. So I kind of follow up the interview, just talking about surcharge compliance and cash discount and compliance and where I see this going the next 12 to 18 months and then even looking out five years. And the, the main gist of it is don't miss opportunities because of a bias that you have towards right. one's particular version of these programs, because each of them has their place, fully compliant cash discounting, you know, non-cash adjustment programs, fully compliant surcharging, you know, they all have their place. Um, and that's what we talk about in that segment. Great. And our episode today is uh, sponsored by LaVu. Um, you can find them at LaVu.com or you can text LaVu to 63975. So are you ready to get into the episode, James? Let's go. Welcome to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Hey, everybody. Patty and I are here today with Jonathan Rossi, the CEO at Cardex, and Sal from Stax. And uh, Jonathan, we've had you on the podcast several times, uh, of course, in the past, talking about surcharging. Today, we're talking about selling surcharging to card not present merchants. And I wanted to start with you today, Sal because Stacks is just growing. For those that don't know, it was previously Fat Merchant. A lot's happened the last year. So can you tell us your story, Sal? How did you get into this crazy industry? And then also talk about this Cardex and the combination here that's uh, that's happening. Yeah, I mean, look, everybody knows you don't find payments, payments finds you. And I think once once you're in it, you're kind of just stuck in it. There's just a, a web of folks that continue to do it. So um, started Fat Merchant back in the day with Senior and I. Uh, we're siblings for people that don't know that. My background prior to that was sales performance management and a different startup out in San Francisco. But um, yeah, so we started on this journey, became the first Netflix of credit card processing as we were coined early on with that. Cool. Um, as we have a subscription-based model, sort of evolved from there to being more of a business management solution platform. Think about integrating multiple ways that you take payments, integrating the top 10 business management solutions. So things like QuickBooks, MailChimp, Salesforce for your CRM, all sort of providing you an integrated place to manage your business. Uh, and then from there, uh, you know, obviously 2020 we continue to grow. We started our ISP channel, which is our Stacks Connect product, which is integrating that product directly into um, different software companies to be able to enable payments. And then we had an opportunity to meet Jonathan and team over at Cardex um, earlier this year. Uh, and we love the card not present space. I'd say about 65% of our payments today are card not present. Um, and we really believed in the surcharging products. Uh, you know, we had just kicked off our own surcharging product and we looked at what Cardex was able to do, both from an enterprise space, honestly, a reg tech perspective, the patents that they were in the process of achieving. Uh, and then frankly, the team, it just seemed like a very synergetic opportunity uh, for us to both work together to enable not only our 25,000 customers, but even the 100 ISV partners that we have to enable them to be able to surcharge specifically in the verticals we serve. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So, so as we talk about selling surcharging to card, not present, you know, Jonathan, you and I have talked many times. Uh, I really believe this is just such a huge opportunity. And, and one of the things I wanted to start with, if I could, is I want to zoom out and talk about business types. So, you know, as you know, our audience, we're talking about, you know, 1099 agents, we're talking about ISO owners, uh, payments executives. When they think about card, not present, you know, my fear is they're kind of visualizing, okay, we're talking about e-commerce and we're talking about high risk. 
Well, yeah. of course, those are card not present, right? But but that's you know that's a small section. There's others. Can you talk about what are these verticals where surcharging is playing really well? What are the verticals that Cardex and now together with Stacks has been you know servicing in the card not present space with surcharging? Yeah, I'd be happy to, James. And first, let me say, great to be back with you and Patty, and great to be on with Sal today. And you know, the first thing I'll do is just echo. Uh, Sal's sentiments about the combination, you know, we couldn't be happier to be part of the Stacks family because this transaction makes some amazing things possible for the team. You know, right. something that Sal, you and the team said to us early on was that this was basically putting premium gasoline in the Cardex engine. That's exactly uh, the good, way I think good about way it. Good way to put it. Yeah. yeah, I love that analogy. They deserve the credit for that one, you know, but I love that our team responded very well to that phrase. And that's exactly the way it has been. It's really accelerating innovation, you know, for that combined company. So card not present, James, to your question, it's really our wheelhouse. Uh, so glad we're, we're digging into it today. In terms of verticals, you can think about a few. Memberships are very strong in that space. Insurance, industrials, technology, those might not be verticals that you typically think about as a consumer. You don't traffic a lot of those necessarily, but those are very strong spaces for a surcharging solution. Same goes for professional services like law, medical, and accounting. They often have a big moto component that's very important. Business to business as well is a place where we do a lot of our, our work at CardX. Sure. And residential and commercial contractors also have a card not present component that's, that's very key. So in terms of what those verticals have in common, if you want to think about it this way, those are verticals with a larger ticket size. They're much more credit heavy relative to debit mm -hmm. in terms of their mix of cards. We don't want to see a lot of debit cards. That's why we avoid small ticket, because the more debit you have, the less of a savings opportunity it is for the merchant. And transparently speaking, the less margin it is for the sales agent. Right. And similarly, these merchants also, in terms of the business type, they're doing a lot of their payments via recurring payment functionality, or they're taking invoice-based payments. And these are often payments when a recurring contract. So that makes it a really great fit for a surcharging solution. And and just to, to clarify, Jonathan, and I, I know that you and we all know this, and but there may be some of our listeners who are not aware of the fact that debit, the reason you don't like debit for surcharging is because you can't surcharge debit, right? Yeah, that's exactly right, Patty. And you know, when our merchants take debit cards, that's the that's the only time the merchant will bear the transaction cost right. because the debit card cannot be surcharged. That comes from both the card brand rules and the state law. So if they're taking debit, that's the time the merchant will pay a discount rate, if you want to think about it that way. Mm -hmm. But some of our merchants actually tell us, listen, we want 0% cost for all the cards we take. So the option they have with us is actually to block debit cards in all environments, even in okay. card not present. Our technology mm -hmm. actually identifies it, blocks it. In order to do that, and I won't go too far into this, but you know, you mentioned RegTech at the top of the call. In order to do that, you actually have to comply with these whole different rules under the card brand rules called right. limited ex acceptance rules. But our merchants and our partners don't need to know about that because we know about that. But that is an interesting <laughs> right. option that some merchants avail themselves of. Yeah, the only thing to add to it, you know, our, our mantra, our mission at Stacks has always been transparency and pricing. So mm -hmm. our goal is to be able to focus on these SMBs, mid-market SMBs, enterprise customers, and really tailor solutions that make sense for them. Um, so when it comes to some of the things that Jonathan's talking about, our goal isn't to surcharge on debit, not only that you can't do it, but our goal is to be able to provide them the lowest cost option for them if that's the direction that they want to go. That's right. also things from ACH for some of these invoices mm -hmm. and other opportunities to be able to provide alternative payments. So I think the way that we really approach it is what is important to the merchant? What is the way that their customer base interacts? And usually amongst the verticals that Jonathan sort of talked about, they're really use case driven. Mm -hmm. And usually most of these people are using invoicing or some other way of payments. And that's kind of where our focus has been. Right, right. So let, let me just sort of segue to you in, on this yep. card not present uh, question. Because obviously I know Stacks has a long uh, track record of success with these verticals. So what is it about surcharging that you think appeals to uh card yeah. present merchants you know i think the um once again i, I think the verticals we serve are obviously you know cardex and stacks being um synonymous in that area when we looked at sort of professional services field services and the areas that we it's the same thing it's high ticket industries mm -hmm. that it's starting to become more and more common Right. Um, I think as interchange rates have continuously gone up, there's different types of regulation that's continuously, the pressures have really become on sort of a lot of these SMBs and mid-market SMBs to take and bear the brunt of 
all the things that come with credit cards. Then you have you have all these things from chargebacks and other areas that these businesses are having to manage. It just becomes difficult. Right. And I think what we're seeing is people, um, at least Generation Z and others, are feeling more and more comfortable taking on and helping out SMBs when it comes to two, three, four percent of a transaction fee. Sure. You know, all of us purchase from Ticketmaster or StubHub or anywhere else. We go to these events. And it's a laundry list of fees that we just click through. Um, right. And it's really about trying to be able to bear that brunt across people. And I think people are willing to do it. And I think as the industry started to become more and more comfortable, as long as you're doing it in a compliant way. And I think that's right. a key word to utilize. Um, we felt very comfortable and sort of betting that that's the direction that we're going to see a lot of, of people shift specifically in the CNP space right. as it continues to grow from service industries and more and more online aspects within it. And so we are big believers in it. We obviously placed a big bet in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we continue to see that being a trend that we're focused on. I love it. I love it. So, uh, you know, Jonathan, I want to go back to you and let's shift the conversation a little bit to our audience, right? So ISOs and agents, okay. Um, you know, as they look at embracing this and, and, and as you know, I mean, it seems like there are some select offices that have just been like really successful with this, but there's also a lot who it, it seems like they feel like it's this other planet from what they do, right? It's like, okay, I got to, you know, number one, selling card, not present. You know, there's a lot of ISOs that frankly, That's not their thing and they haven't really focused on it. And, you know, and then, you know, then the idea of the compliance surcharge. So what I'm curious to hear from you is as you look at your successful offices, that you look at the the ISOs and agents that have sold specifically surcharging to card not present, are there any patterns that you see? What what are they doing right? What are they doing wrong? Give us some, some tips or insights that you see there. Well, you know, it's a very consultative sale. So I understand exactly what you mean. You're not selling a commodity. You really shouldn't even be selling on price because even though, cost savings is a big part of the appeal. It's really a software sale. And I'll talk about that a little more later on, but in terms of the strategies that work finding prospects, I mean, it really runs the gamut. I've actually seen a lot of different strategies work across our sales partner offices. Could be digital advertising, could be account-based marketing, could be content marketing. So there are a lot of different paths to success there. What I would tell you is where things really focus down, and there's actually, in my opinion, kind of one strategy that's been much more clearly successful in the market is the value proposition. You know, if you just look at the traction in the market, what's been a little bit less successful over the past few years are some of the products that have come out and they're taking what I would call an intentionally narrow scope. You know, they don't solve for compliance. I'll just touch on the importance of compliance. They don't offer purpose-built reporting or reconciliation for surcharging. That's so important for our merchants and their internal teams to have a successful time, right? This is my point beyond the cost savings. They really need to have a successful surcharging launch for them and also for their customer base. And the products that I've seen just kind of add that fee on top of a legacy payments experience, I don't think are really getting there. You know, in contrast, where I think a lot of value is to be had, and just of course, transparently, this is the card positioning, is offering the merchant not just the payments experience, but also on top of that, the compliance technology, And on top of that, what I would call an IT and business process automation layer to make surcharging totally automated. Like what's a concrete example of that to get specific? Colorado. And James, you and Patty are aware that Colorado is gonna permit surcharging starting on July 1st, so just a few Mm -hmm. months out. I work with some great bipartisan bill sponsors there. I testified in the Colorado House, which is a great experience. That law is going to permit surcharging with robust consumer protections, very important in that state. So if you're going to surcharge in Colorado, in other words, there are five or six things you need to do. It's like a specific disclosure in that state, rules around which cards are eligible, rules around pricing, itemization, a lot of stuff. So to my point about kind of owning the whole surcharging scope and that being the value that you want to provide, the function of a a reg tech solution as you look at this trend towards prescriptive law around the country is our product does it automatically for the merchant. Whereas others might say, you know, that's the merchant's problem. Right. Uh, call a lawyer, look at the state by state rules. You know, you figure out the laws of your state. Bringing that back to our conversation around card not present, that is a very difficult framing for a, a CNP merchant, right? They operate online. An enterprise merchant might have payers in literally all 50 states. So they're looking for a technology partner to address mm-hmm. that whole map for them. So to your point about how to be successful in this space, especially as you look at card not present, I think that's a value function. That's that's a value proposition rather that's a step function better than the other stuff you see in the market, but it's very hard to execute well. Sure. This is a, this is a quick follow-up on that. You know, Sal, I'm kind of curious your, your thoughts on some of this, because 
you know, obviously, you know, Stacks is looking at surcharging, looking at what Cardex yeah. is doing, you know, are you seeing this as well where, you know, one of the issues with a lot of the non-compliant, you know, programs that are out there, the, the you know, non-cash adjustment type stuff, I have seen a lot of difficulty with people trying to bring that to the card not present. Is that yeah. something you've seen as well, Sal, that kind of motivated this? <laughs> Yeah, no, we, we see it all the time. I mean, the amount of phone calls, I mean, as you know, we're a, a full inbound engine, the, the right. way we go to market. And so, you know, we get a variety of phone calls with so many people being like, oh, well, I, they told me I can do that in this state. And they told me I can do that. And I don't have to do this. And our, our reps, obviously, there's some frustration when they're trying to educate. And I'd say a, most of our job on surcharging sales are education. Mm-hmm. It's not even about right. trying to sell them a software product. We're trying to explain to them why they aren't compliant or why these things aren't there. And as they start to unpack that, um, I think the more sophisticated ones, larger merchants start to relay that. I mean, when you look at the yep. combined portfolio of Cardex and Stacks, I mean, our average merchant's doing about a million dollars in um, in GMV. And, and that's where we focus is sort of what we coin the mid-market SMB. We're usually not dealing with you know super small merchants. And so usually there's a little bit more compliance. They do care about other things beyond just cost savings, going back to Jonathan's point of value proposition. I'm not saying we don't serve a great market down here that are doing doing less, but I think it's really about the importance to those customers. And so we definitely have people that will send us a, a rate from somebody else and saying that they're doing it and specifically on the card present side. And we're like, no, it, it doesn't work that way. You have to figure out where the actual invoice is generating. You have to figure out what state they're paying it. And there's just a lot of complexity. Um, and I think that even as somebody that's been in payments for eight years, um, it's not easy. I mean, these are massive right. matrices with different interchange tables by different states that are changing on July 1st and ever evolving, right. but somebody has to do the work. And I think the thing that we continuously learn specifically in our ISV space, as we continue to grow, that is these software companies are software companies. They're not payment companies. And these right. merchants we're dealing with are not payment companies. It's not their job right. they to be able to that. think about compliance. Like we have to help remove that burden from them. And I really believe that that's where our software and technology combine to let them do what they do best and remove the friction of the rest of this. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, Jonathan, it, there seems to be a perception, at least at the, what, from what I can tell that, you know, and as, as um, Sal just alluded to that it's, you know, more complex to activate a merchant on compliance surcharging. And I was wondering if maybe you could give us a feel for, you know, what are the steps? What's, you know, what's involved in activating these merchants? And also maybe you could talk a little bit about how the combination with stacks impacts uh, your ability to to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Patty, I think it's a great question. And I agree actually that it's more complex. I'll just give you an example of one of the ways in which it is more complex than sort of a traditional payment sale. You know, just think about reconciliation. I alluded to it earlier right. in the surcharging context. You know, now with surcharging, the merchant's going to receive a batch deposit that includes some transactions with surcharges, some transactions without surcharges. And that makes it hard for them to reconcile unless they have the right tools. You know, right. it's not even as simple as credit versus debit because some of the credit card sales that originate in no surcharge states are not going to have any surcharge applied to them, of course. So the products, this is to your point about how do we make that a successful implementation? In that case, the products need to automate reconciliation. The merchant needs to have a software tool that immediately helps them understand who paid them, links the individual transactions they process to the batch deposit they received. So they're not manually looking at today's deposit right. and saying, hold on, who are the customers I can now, you know, mark as paid. So, you know, how, how, how do they get started with, with compliance surcharging? The key really is to deliver the solution at whatever level of IT resources or sophistication the merchant has. You know, for SMBs, they're gonna be using our portal. They can drop in a payment form with one line of code, has all the functionality built in. That, for example, is like a copy paste approach that's super simple. Mm-hmm. For enterprise, you know, that might be deeply integrating API products into their internal systems because they have internal dashboards for their staff to perform those functions. So that again is kind of a spectrum and they get to choose where they want to be on that spectrum. And I'll just mention, because I think it's a, I think it's a cool point that our, our collective teams have achieved What's actually pretty neat is our portal actually uses our own API endpoints. So it's a very consistent experience, no matter where you are on that implementation Mm -hmm. spectrum that the Cardex portal actually uses the car. Eyes. But I think it's a big opportunity for, for, for sales partners out there to differentiate themselves because everything we're talking about in terms of a successful implementation is actually beyond just reducing processing costs. Mm-hmm. It's actually helping these businesses improve their business processes. They can really yeah. use a solution 
to modernize how they're doing accounts receivable. And I think that's a much broader proposition than just competing on price. Sure, love it. And just to add to that, you know, the power of Stacks and Cardex also is important there. And I think that what you'll see from us combined probably in Q2 this year, I mean, we're our own payment facilitator. We own our own risk. We own our own underwriting. You will see us be able to onboard Cardex customers or surcharging less than 20 minutes. So for the moment you land on our website to be able to take a card not present transaction uh -huh. and get funded in less than 20 minutes, starting the, the second half of this year, second quarter of this year, as we finish some of the integrations, because it is the power of being able to enable these folks. Going back to what we do, we buy software, we sell software, not payments. Right. When's the last time you bought Netflix and waited for somebody to come integrate it for you, right? You, you don't do that. You purchase it's like waiting it for the disc to arrive in the mail, <laughs> like the old exactly. days, right? <laughs> exactly. And so, so our jobs, you know, as software folks, as innovators within the space is to create a software-like experience where somebody can click purchase. Obviously there's KYC and Patriot Act and AML that we still have to go through those processes, but our job mm -hmm. is to automate that to the best of our ability within every single merchant experience and being able to combine those platforms to be able to start to take certain charging payments in less than 20 minutes, we believe is very powerful. Yeah. yeah, so I'd love to just add on to that point because I completely agree with you. I mean, the combination with Stacks allows us to go a lot further down this sort of innovation roadmap that we're talking about for a few reasons. And honestly, you know, James and Patty, I would consider it bigger than just surcharging. I kind of think about it as payments automation, if you want to think about right. it that way. Right. But over the years, you know, there's a lot that I've learned through our experience with our own merchants, customer feedback requests that they have things that I've wanted to build that actually you can't deliver on legacy platforms. And I won't right. go too far into it right now, but I'll just say at a high level, you know, a percentage-based discount. Say their rate. name, Jonathan, don't worry about it. Call them out. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look, you know, we value all of our uh, partner relationships from the ones that are Netflix online to the ones that are shipping the CD Netflix, you know, right, to the right, ones that right. are Blockbuster. Okay, and we have some partners that really are still in the world of Blockbuster. And what right. I'll tell you is, there are just certain features that, that you can't deliver on those platforms. We'll always right. support them. But what we're gonna do now that we have the Stacks Payfac empowering us is be able to build really some unique and I think very influential features in the surcharging space. So that's gonna be coming yep. out all through next year and we're excited about it. Love it, love it. Okay, cool. So, cool. so so Sal, I wanna, I wanna kind of zoom out a little bit and you know, combining with Cardex, that was a, that's a big deal, right? And so not only is it a big deal because you're choosing, you know, compliant surcharging is like, this is where Stacks stands. But in addition to that, you know, you're choosing the leader in surcharging that is literally leading the way with most of these legal challenges and, and things of this nature. So obviously there was a lot of behind the scenes conversations that went into this decision to say, this is where we stand, especially because unlike most of your competitors in our space, in the payment space, you're very public. You know, you guys have the PR engine going and you're on, you know, a lot of inbound leads, social media, content marketing. So this is a very big deal, very public statement. And so I just kind of want to get your thoughts. You know, how do you see this playing out? We've seen other countries, we've seen surcharging play out. How do you see this playing out in the market? And give us a little more of the high level rationale of like, why did Stacks decide, hey, we're going to stake our claim on compliant surcharging? Yeah, look, I, I think for Stacks, our evolution has been, obviously we're a growth company. Um, you know, we onboard, I don't know, 2000 customers on a monthly basis across our platforms. And, you know, our goal is continuously being a software innovator. To be able to do that, you have to take some bets that go beyond where we are. Um, you know, we made a rebrand in the, in the middle of this year in April, going from Fat Merchant to Stacks. And a big reason was that is we've really seen a shift within payment technology being important to these customers. If you look back at Amazon, Walmart, et cetera, they've all hired chief payment officers. It's starting to be something that's key within these organizations to create a better customer experience. And so Stacks was created to be the payment stack for mid-market SMBs, SMBs, and enterprise customers to really be able to think about that. As we looked across that, we wanted to say, where are the directions we serve best and who are the areas that we want to continue to focus on? And we've seen a massive continued shift in services and card not present. I think that area has been under catered to. Um, and, you know, you're starting to see a lot of point solutions, whether it's you know, a bill.com for ACH, et cetera, but there's never been a unified area of omni-channel commerce. And that's always been our core thesis of combining card present, card not present, ACH into a single platform. And when we looked at that opportunity and the direction and what we serve, which is to empower these SMBs to think smarter, move faster and make better decisions, we saw 
surcharging is an area that was very important to us. So we went out and built it. I actually believe, James, we called you and you worked with us to be able to design some of the first you know, aspects of how we can make it work. Um, and I think we started to launch V1 and V2, and there was just a lot of complexity. And yep. as we continued to go down that route, you know, we had an opportunity to meet Jonathan and team, and we just felt that it would propel and accelerate for our customers the innovation that they desire, as well as for us, you know, a one plus one equals eleven relationship. And so, I don't. Jonathan and team were not in market. Um, you know, we convinced him over some dinner, some drinks, and that's a different story that I don't know your audience can handle right now, but uh, uh, it was the drinks. That was it. <laughs> it was beyond that. The deal was made somewhere around two 30 in the morning, but um, at, at point, he just uh, wore him down. <laughs> I think, uh, He's very persuasive, Patty. He's very persuasive. I bet. Oh, it's a great team. Yeah, a great yeah. team. You know, and, and I think that that's how we see the market shifting. And when we look across, um, I think the direction that the world is moving, I think people going back to the Gen Z comment, are okay with paying and helping out small and medium-sized businesses. Right. I think we've all kind of come to that realization that we want everybody to be successful. COVID was a great impact to show how much that the SMB community specifically impacts the GDP of the United States. And this is a small but big way to help them do that. And I think we as society are okay with paying two, 3% to be able to help them offset that load. And so- we think about that at a macro level, and we believe that these are the things that can help enable those businesses. And now as a business owner, you have the choice to make that. We're not forcing anything upon you. You get to dictate the direction that you want to take. Um, and our goal is to provide you with those tool sets. And we believe that generally the, uh, you know, the legislation will follow as it continues to have shown that it's gone that direction. We believe it's going to continue to go that way, specifically with alternative payments and decentralized areas of blockchain and Bitcoin and so many different areas that are entering into the space. Right. We believe that this will be um, a basic functionality in five years from now. And yeah. being at the forefront of being somebody that can innovate and clear that path, we're willing to invest in the future and bring on great talent like Jonathan and his team that can help pave that way with us. I love it. it you know, interesting. Sorry to interrupt you, James. I was going to okay. say your point about Bitcoin. You know, when you think about it, surcharging actually makes credit card payments more like Bitcoin. Because when you make a Bitcoin payment, I don't know much about this firsthand, but I read about it. When you make a Bitcoin <laughs> payment, actually, as the payer, you pay the transaction cost. Right. It's not like the world of traditional merchant services. Right. 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 Actually, this is the way you should have designed a system from the ground up. And that's the way that alternative next generation payments right. are being designed from the ground Ground yeah. up. Yeah, I, Actually, love it. I hadn't thought about that until you mentioned that, but that's very yeah, true, true, Jonathan. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it, I think one of the other interesting things about the combination that I thought of when I saw the announcement is like seriously from a PR perspective, like you two here with us today represent like 90% of the PR work that's done in our industry. It's ridiculous. You know, like seriously, like you guys are the only ones. Like every time it's like, oh, here's a news article about payments. Well, I know Stacks is going to be either it's going to be Stacks or Card X. So right. I think it's fantastic because I think I think this is a PR game, right? I mean, sure. public perception, you know, the perception of state legislatures, the, you know, this is a perception game. And I think you're positioned really well to win. So okay. So Jonathan, my last question for you. Um, and then I do want to get some contact information and some some insight there, but Talk about the economic model a little bit. You know, we don't want to dive too much into the weeds, but again, I'm trying to dispel some perceptions here that might keep ISOs and agents from selling compliant surcharging to card not present. You know, and there we'll I'll give you a funny, a funny story that you'll enjoy, Jonathan. So I had just literally yesterday, we had one of our ISO clients, uh, John, Jonathan from my team said, hey, I've got this call with one of our clients. They're convinced that the our statement analysis software that has compliant surcharging as a pricing template, they're convinced that it's wrong. You know, because it's showing no savings for the merchant. Well, it's because they were trying to sell like a convenience store with an $8 average ticket. And I'm like, they're 80% debit. Like you're charging them more on debit than they were paying. You're right. wiping out, you know, like, no. And so um, I think there is that confusion. So talk about the ep economic model. Why does it make sense? And maybe where does it make sense? So give us a little context, if you would, on that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in its simplest terms, you know, think about the partnership margin as being the difference between the surcharge rate and the underlying cost of the card. And then of course, in the debit context, I mentioned at the top of our podcast, the merchant will bear the discount rate for a debit card. And while there is some margin in that, you know, it's not much because you have to compete with the other options where the merchant bears, bears the fee. But you right. know, there are a few things I'd say about uh, why the economics are so attractive. You know, one, in card not present, if you're targeting the right verticals, 
credit cards are much more common than debit. We have right. B2B merchants that have single digit debit card acceptance, like 95% of the cards they accept are credit. So that's a perfect sort of fit for surcharging you want to find. But because mm -hmm. on the one hand, the savings opportunity for the merchant is very significant. And on the other hand, for the sales agent, it also means better margin. And the other thing I'd point out, you know, we, we spoke about it a little bit earlier. The average ticket also is much higher in card not present as compared to card present. So in our in our customer base, our average ticket is between five hundred to six hundred dollars for our card not present merchants on average. Mm -hmm. That is, again, <laughs> translates to good margin for the sales agent. So that's another thing they should be looking for. Definitely you don't wanna do super small ticket merchants for a couple of reasons. You're gonna see a lot of debit cards. And also remember that the surcharging rules cap the surcharge at, at 4% as a maximum cap, no matter the transaction value. So just take an extreme example, if their average ticket is a dollar, that surcharge is gonna be capped at four cents and they're never gonna offset the transaction costs and the sales agent's probably right. gonna be underwater. You know, the final thing I'd say in terms of uh, why this is a really good fit. Remember that the surcharging sale is so resonant in a time like this, because in an inflationary environment, you have merchants being hit with rising costs from all their suppliers. Like mm -hmm. as a business owner, any input you have right now, the cost is going up. So they're very much looking for the opportunity to offset costs, again, in a compliant manner, fair manner, also good for their consumers. But if you haven't been selling surcharging yet, I think now is a great time to get in because of that resonance that it has. Love it. So yeah. Sal, as we wrap things up, I'll kick this back to you. And then, you know, either one of you may have an answer for this, but I know it's very early days. Obviously, I mean, this combination is is literally, I think, well, like a month old or something as far as, you know, officially uh, coming out with that. So um, I don't know what message you have for our audience. We have 1099 agents, we have ISOs, we have payments executives. What type of opportunities are you looking for? What contact information would you give them if they want to reach out and they say, hey, this sounds great. I want to sell compliant surcharging to, uh, you know, card not present, and I want to do it to, with the card X stacks combination. What would you tell our audience and where would you send them? Hey, look, one, you know, stackspayments.com for any merchant or anybody that's specifically looking for payments or cardx.com. Both of them will route back to our, our same style as we integrate teams within that, whichever platform you're looking for. When it comes to ISOs and agents, you know, today, historically, we haven't done a ton on that relationship side within the stacks perspective. I know there are some relationships that Cardex has to be able to enable that platform. And it's something that we're continuously exploring. And then if you're a software company, I believe we're the only API or ISV enabler, both from a payback perspective that will have card not present surcharging within our platform, meaning you can embed right. surcharging directly across your portfolio base to be able to expand that. You know, for us, I mean, it's Sal at stackspayments.com. Feel free to shoot me a note. Um, you know, our goal is to be able to enable commerce, enable the folks of these to, to be able to drive that. And like we bring value. I think one of the things that you mentioned on asking the ISO agents and the economic model, the thing that kind of gets failed to be mentioned is at Stacks and at Cardex, our churn is half of the industry average. I mean, right. we're at like, 10, 11, 12% churn, right? Compared to the average industry is 20, 25%. So it's not just about margin, et cetera. It's also about keeping, retaining and making happy customers. We have 60 plus NPS scores, which are net promoter scores to be able to actually talk about, which is not even just payments leading, it's software leading. And I think right. those are important points that just get lost in some of these transactions and these conversations. Um, but we'd love to work with you. If there's a way for us to make it happen, we, we'd absolutely explore that opportunity. Oh, absolutely. You know, the, the piece I'd add, Sal, is, you mentioned that at Cardex, we have some strong ISO relationships, and we really like to find those select, could be ISO or agent partners who want to sell up market, who are prepared for that consultative sale, who have those relationships with exactly the kinds of merchants we've been talking about today. And I think this combination is really exciting for those partner constituencies that we have, because when you think about it, post deal after this integration, there are going to be value added features we're actually introducing in the Cardex product line mm -hmm. that are only possible because now we're building on top of the Stacks platform. So it actually right. gives our partners a way into this very powerful ecosystem you have that you're so right until this point has only been available to your dominant direct sales team and also to the ISV partners you serve. This is now another way that we're kind of making that available to the industry in a way that's a win-win, you know? So we'd be very happy to, to chat with any partners who are interested. My email is jonathan at cardex.com. You can also reach us at partners at cardex.com, but it's been great being back on the podcast today. Awesome. Oh, it's been great having you back. Well, thank you both. I really appreciate the time, Sal and Jonathan. You go both very busy and you took the time to educate our audience today and I really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. Yes. Enjoy. Have a great day. Well, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Have a great new year and we'll talk in 2022. 
So Patty, I had a really interesting exchange uh, yesterday with Salim, uh, who we've interviewed on the podcast before. He's actually going right. to be doing the next week, the episode next as well uh, from, right. from, from Lavu. And so, you know, what we were talking about is kind of this challenge, you know, that that ISOs face in really breaking into this market of selling cash discounting to restaurants right. and, you know, the simplicity that they're used to of selling cash discounting now becoming more of a consultative approach. Now they're, right. you know, they were selling Clover. Now they're selling this iPad solution and, you know, and all right, that. And right. so what I really want to challenge our audience to do, for those of you that have already shown an interest, we've been talking about Lavu. I, you know, put out all kinds of information about them already. Um, if you haven't yet, of course, we mentioned it already. You know, you can text Lavu, L-A-V-U. You can text that to 63975. Get some information. But, you know, if you've already thought about that, you've already reached out, you know, what's the next step? And, and I'll tell you what the next step is. It's very simple. You're going to be like, well, of course, James. But the next step is go sell a restaurant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, we all know what's going to happen when you do that, right? Is it going to be super smooth? Everything's going to be what you thought. You're going to say the perfect thing. You're going to demo the No. It's, you know, no, it it's a is. challenge. It's <laughs> your right. first one. Like some of you are salespeople. Right. You've been selling, you know, cash discounting. You sell 10 cash discounting deals a month, but you've never sold a sit-down restaurant cash discounting. And mm -hmm. you're used to selling another point of sale system or whatever. Just go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off. Okay. We've all had that experience where Ouch. we pull the Band-Aid off <laughs> one hair yep. at a time. Right, right. right. And you just, you know, you know, you just, you rip the Band-Aid off. So go sell a restaurant on Lavu again, ex, you know, I, I love when I would sell a new system, I would always tell my first merchant, I'd say, Hey, um, you know, I'd say, look, I'm really excited about this. This is a, a bit of a newer one for me, but it's so valuable. It's so cutting edge. I want to make sure you understand Mr. Merchant. I am going to be like your employee for the next 30 days. Like I will mm -hmm. do whatever is necessary to make this work, but there's going to be some bumps along the way. There's going right. to be some hiccups. I'm, and I am going to work with you, but guess what? The end result, if we make it through all that, you're going to save $27,000 a year, whatever it is, right? right. Whatever the number, right? Whatever. You know, there's, there's enough leverage here to get them moving, but you need to go sell one. And I would encourage you if you're a, uh, an agent that's more experienced, you've got some residuals built up, or if you're an ISO, give it to them for free. Like just go get one, you know, buy mm -hmm. the hardware for them. You know, it's going to mm -hmm. make you a fortune anyway, buy the hardware, do whatever it takes, but get out there, get your best rep and say, Hey, you're, get your best rep on a demo with Lavu. Let them see it. Get them a, an iPad if they don't already have one and download Lavu and get a demo account and like go through the motions, make the sale. Because what I worry about is I know for a fact, like this is not something I'm guessing. I know absolutely for a fact that somewhere around July, August of this of 2022, I promise you, I will be getting emails every week from a different salesperson, a different ISO that says, we started selling Lavu or we started selling cash discounting to restaurants and we've increased our residuals 20,000 a month, 30,000 yep. a month, 50,000 yep. a month. Yep. I will be getting those emails. I'm sure you will. So the question for those of you listening is, am I going to get one of those emails from you? Or are you going to be one of the ones that's like, well, I saw it, but it was kind of complicated and I never went out and tried to sell it. Like, you got to go sell one of these things. It's yeah. way, it's a lot easier than you think to sell it. And it's probably just as hard as you think to get it going and get it installed and activated. The first right. one is going to be complicated. I'm not going to lie to you, but the thing is restaurants want this and they're willing to jump through some hoops. So just be honest with them. Don't tell them like, Oh, it's a snap. We set it up in 20 minutes. No, tell them like, look, you know, this is going to be a process. Take time. Yeah, I'm gonna, but I'm going to make sure everything is ready before we go live. Um, and right. then I'm going to be available once we go live and work with the Lavu team closely. But this is one of those hurdles that is worth overcoming in mm -hmm. order to sell cash discounting to restaurants. Believe me, it's worth it. So all that to say, Lavu is a sponsor of our podcast this month. Um, they are a processor agnostic point of sale solution for sit down restaurants that offer cash discounting. Go to lavu.com, L-A-V-U, or you can text L-A-V-U, Lavu, the word Lavu, you can text that to 63975 and they will respond back with a link how you can get more information about reselling their point of sale system. And now, here is Questions from the Field with James Shepard. So, Patty, in my segment today, I want to talk about the future of cash discounting and surcharging compliance. Um, obviously, we had a great interview uh, with mm -hmm. Jonathan Razi and with Sal. And then, you know, Sal even alluded to uh, early days as they were talking about their surcharging platform and that I was a consultant there and was working with them. And so I do that quite a bit. I work with companies as they're developing their these programs. And, right. you know, 
a couple of points that I want to make today that I think are, are interesting. So, so number one, let me start by kind of zooming out and, and clarifying a few things for those in our audience that maybe aren't as familiar with these topics. So when, when I say words like non-compliant cash discounting, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you know, the question is always compliant with who or non-compliant with who. So right. when we look at a Jonathan Razi, a Cardex, and now together with Stacks, what do they have? Well, what they have is a fully compliant surcharging solution, which means not only are they compliant with visa rules around surcharging, but they're also compliant with state law and federal law um, that is an ever, you know, evolving, developing Ever thing. evolving. And, and each state has its own little, yes. you know, iterations of the law. Right. There's no uniform approach to this. On the There's states. not. There's right. not. And so that's a big part of their kind of value proposition, right? So, mm-hmm. you know, then when I say a non-compliant program, well, you know, when we look at the industry right now, our audience would, you know, disproportionately offer what, what you would call a non-compliant cash discount program. So what is a fully compliant cash discount program? Well, if you want a fully compliant cash discount program, meaning compliant with visa rules, uh, with the state and, you know, and federal regulations and all that, well, then you would be actually increasing the price on the shelf or of every item of every item. And then you would be offering an actual discount uh, when they pay with cash. Right now, then we have this middle, uh, which is where 85 percent of our listeners are at in the middle, which is what, you know, somebody like a Jonathan Razi and even I would call a, a non-compliant cash discount, meaning non-compliant with visa rules specifically. Right. OK, right. now <clears throat> my argument and the argument of, of others that offer this is that we have the right to be non-compliant with visa rules here because of the Durban Amendment that mm-hmm. protects cash discounting and specifically mentions the card brands and says that they cannot inhibit someone right. from offering one of these incentive uh, type programs or cash discount programs. They call it an in-kind incentive or a cash discount. So um, there's definitely a compliance argument to be made. I've made it many, many times. I won't make it again. Um, but I personally believe that all three of these options uh, have mm-hmm. a bright future ahead of them. Um, I think about companies like VisiPay that we've had on several times that actually sure. offers a true compliant cash discount program where they help their merchants raise the price and they implement right. software and all that. So, um, you know, I see this entire spectrum. So I want to talk about really just a couple of, of key insights that I think are important to understand moving forward. Um, number one, I am convinced that at least in the short term for the next 12 to 18 months, I really am convinced that you want to sell compliant surcharging to card not present. Um, mm-hmm. It's the reason I, I asked Jonathan right. Razi and Sal to join us today um, and, and talk about it because uh, again, I'm I'm in the know on this. I believe me. I like work with a lot of different ISOs. Okay, and it's and a wide open opportunity, James. It is and it's really been untouched for yes since this whole thing started. Yes, and and the people that are implementing the cash discount on card not present, um, it's not working very well for two reasons. No. Number number one. There doesn't seem to be much of a focus on the technology there. I, I literally mm-hmm. don't even know of a single company. I think one will emerge over the next 18 months. But right now, I don't know of a company that's doing a what I would call a non-compliant cash discount or a, you know, kind of a, you could use it even with maybe an ACH option, uh, mm-hmm. something like that. But, right. but nobody is implementing it in the robust way that a card X or a stack should be implementing it. So mm-hmm. the problem with that is there really aren't good integrations with, you know, uh, shopping carts and things like that to pull this off. Right. So you can you can piece it together with something like an NMI or something like that, but it's it's very challenging. Um, the second reason is card not present merchants, they do have generally much larger average ticket sizes mm-hmm. and people are more aware of the fee. Right. Um, and the companies tend to be a little bit more concerned with compliance. Um, right. And so, you know, some of that's driven by the consumer behavior, right? It's like, well, um, you know, I just processed a $2,000 order, right? Why did you add $70 onto it for a non-cash charge or a surcharge right. or a service right. fee or whatever? You know, it, it, like, wait a minute, you know, what is this? They're going to ask. And so then that right. puts the, right. the merchant in a position where they have to answer the question. And so compliance becomes a much bigger thing. And next thing you know, they're reaching out to you saying, hey, my customer says I shouldn't be charging this because they use their debit card instead of their credit card. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now we have a problem, all right? So, right, um, right. so again, I want to make it really clear when we look at this spectrum, when we say, com- you know, fully compliant surcharging, we have fully compliant cash discounting, and then in the middle we have the non-cash adjustment type programs, which would be not compliant with Visa rules. But again, I believe there's a rationale to offer them because we're compliant with the Durban Amendment and all that. So, I don't believe I'm not against any of the three. In fact, I'm for all three of them. Right. And my first observation, though, is for card not present. 
I think the compliance surcharging has some distinct advantages, both from a compliance perspective and just in a full integration, uh, peace sure. of mind type situation there. I agree, um, yeah. And as Jonathan pointed out, and you know, made lots of good points, but one of them that's true is with card not present, they do a lot more credit card than debit. Um, right. People are right. generally still a little bit, a little bit leery of using their debit card online for many I agree. reasons. I, I'm the on the same way, and yeah. and there's also, don't you? I think as Jonathan pointed out as well, you know, when people are buying online, there's much more, you know, the the ticket the ticket size tends to be much larger. Higher. You yes. know, I go in and I buy a trinket for, for my, you know, for my kids at Christmas at a little store. Right. But if I'm going to, you know, but I also m- m- then might go online and buy them a snowsuit. Right. 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 <laughs> if you're going online to buy something, you're probably spending more. People are already less likely to use debit. They're even more or less. They're even less likely because it's a larger ticket size. So right. to clarify the economic model there for people that don't understand this, selling surcharge, compliant surcharging versus say a non-cash adjustment if the merchant is using 100% credit, if they're accepting 100% credit, the economic model is identical. You're going to make the same residual. It, right. it doesn't matter. The only reason the economic model is different is that you're going to make less on debit. You're not going to lose money, but you're going to make less on debit than you would um, mm-hmm. you know, on credit if you're doing compliant surcharging. So in my mind, you add all that up. Compliant surcharging is the way to go with card not present right now. Now, here's the other thing that I want to say, though, that I think is so important. Um, and, and our industry is just cannot seem to wrap their head around yet. And that is I wish that I could convince our audience that these things that, that were not enemies in terms of mm-hmm. these solutions. Right. The yeah. fundamental concept is that the consumer is going to pay a little bit more when they use their card. Right. right? Maybe their credit and their debit card, maybe just their credit card. Um, that's the core concept. And what you're going to see, I believe, really strongly, what you're going to see over the next 36 to you know 60 months here is you're going to see these concepts finally coming together in, in a Morphing, way right yeah yes and yeah. i think that'll happen through legislation it will happen through court cases it'll happen through people like jonathan Rossi and um, practices and you know yes. just just best practices really yes yeah. yes but I, but i think it's going to be you know it's going to be forced on the industry in some ways right and so, mm-hmm. so the idea is i think i think five years from now what i'm trying to say is i think five years from now we're all going to be offering the same thing Right. right. If you're right now saying, well, I do a non-cash adjustment, I would never do compliant surcharging. Why? You're you're both going to be offering the same thing in five years mm-hmm. anyway. In other words, mm-hmm. legislation mm-hmm. is going to come out. Now, I believe it's going to come out and say, hey, you can surcharge debit, but you can only do it at this amount. And then there's going to yeah. start to be more enforcement. And, right. and so there's going to, you know, we've seen this play out in other countries. I believe it's going to play out the same here. And so I think it's going to be increased regulation, um, increased, you know, state laws and things of that nature. And so you know, don't look at it and say, well, I, you know, I'm on the non-cash adjustment team. I'm not on the compliance surcharge team. That's right, my enemy. Right, right. We're not no, competing. No. Right. We're, you know, that's, that's not your enemy. Okay. It's a different way right. of doing it. And the thing is you need to understand what the merchant wants. So if you're right. out there targeting small retail businesses, you know, liquor stores or whatever, you know, like, well, yeah, you're probably going to sell non-cash adjustment, you, you know, like, if you're right. targeting pizza shops, you're probably not offering compliance surcharging because, you know, they're doing 20000 a month. They love cash discounting. It's simple. It's easy to sell the non-cash adjustment program. And, and they're not as concerned about compliance. Their customers aren't as concerned about paying the 40 cents. It's not a big deal, right? Um, you know, but you say, well, I really want to go after the card not present. You know, I see people where they're missing opportunities because they're, well, I'm against compliance surcharging. Why would you be mm-hmm. against? Why would you be against anything that's going to, you know, cr- right. potentially get, bring you more residuals? Right. So I think it's right now, I think we're in an interesting place. You know, I think if, if Visa wanted to take massive action to enforce their rules in opposition to the Durban Amendment, they would have already done so. Um, I agree. So I, I think we're in a pretty good place right now as an industry. I think we can kind of come together a little bit and say, wow, we have a lot of cool options to make a lot of money in 2022. And, and that's instead the of, point is that you, if you do it now, you, you know, you're right. getting in, you know, when the market is still wide open, you can right. capture some significant share if you really put right. your mind to it. Yep. And then if you have to switch things around and eventually some of your non-cash adjustments are going to go to a service fee and or, or maybe your surcharges, you're going to end up surcharging debit eventually when that becomes legal to do so and, and accept, you know, right. Who cares? Like, that's good. That's good. Like, that's fine. So it's just a- icing on the cake. It is. And so that's just that's the direction that I see it going. So, you know, yeah. my thought as we go into 2022 is 
2022 is a fantastic year to take advantage of these opportunities for consumers to pay a higher cost for acceptance. Um, and, you know, I've been defending that on LinkedIn lately. I've been defending it on Facebook and, you know, I believe in this and I really get frustrated. You know, I, I, I stay very professional on social media. The only time I get a little heated, I actually have a, had a comment exchange. You can look at my LinkedIn profile if you want to see it, but I had a pretty heated exchange actually yesterday where I do get a little frustrated with the, the, the payments industry professionals that are basically trying to say, well, I'm morally superior than you yeah. because I don't sell any of those programs. I only right. sell traditional processing. Well, right. what if your customer, what if your merchant wants, wants one of those programs, right? right. What or, do you do? Say no, go, go to somebody else? Right. Or it's, well, I'm right. morally superior because I'm only selling compliant surcharging and you're one of these, you know, greedy, evil reps that are selling the, the non-cash adjustment program. You know, like, no, you're not morally superior to anybody else. It's an open market. You're doing what customers, what your, your merchants want. Your merchants are paying for the value they're receiving. If they don't want to pay it, they're not. They're going to go to a competitor. Like, we're, this isn't a church service. This is a capital, like, this is a capitalism system. Like, it's a market. It's a free market. So we don't need to all be enemies with each other over, well, you're doing this, I'm doing that. No, like there's plenty of space. There's plenty of ways we can go. Certainly we want to compete with each other. Certainly we want to say, I believe my idea is the best way. I believe this, I believe right. I know what's best for you as a business owner because you are a payments professional, you're a consultant. But at the end of the day, we're all generally going after this main concept. And I think what's going to happen is three to five years from now, we're all going to look back at this time and say, why were we all so mad at each other over right, these different right? things? They, well, what, they, were, what was that all about? That all yeah. ended up becoming the same thing anyway. Who cares? Right. So I would right. just encourage people as you go to 2022, don't miss opportunities in the cracks because you're so focused on, well, I sell this. I don't sell that. Well, maybe mm -hmm. you should sell that. Maybe yeah. you should think about that. You know, maybe somebody else selling that is a good thing for them to do. So right. you know, that, that's what right. I would say. Really good advice, James. Thanks. This is the Insider's Report with Patty Murphy. Well, you know, James, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, it's taking a hard look at big tech firms and the role they play in consumer payments. Uh, now, just a little background for folks who may not be familiar. Uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, also better known as CFPB, is a federal consumer watchdog agency that was created in the aftermath of the 20, uh, 2008 uh, financial meltdown. It's an independent bureau within the Federal Reserve with its director appointed by the president, and it's focused on promoting fairness in consumer financial services. So to that end, it monitors the financial marketplace and issues enforcement actions when it thinks players aren't playing fairly. Um, and it has authority over um, banks and credit unions with assets over $10 billion, as well as not large non-banks in the consumer financial market, such as like things like Visa and MasterCard um, because of their networks. Well, back in October, the CFPB ordered six major tech firms to turn over information about how they harvest and, prof and profit from users' payment data. The orders were issued to Amazon. Apple, Facebook, Google, PayPal, and Square. Then earlier this month, it issued orders to five companies in the buy now, pay later space, seeking information on the risks and benefits of these fast growing loan products. Those orders went out to Affirm, Afterpay, which is in the process of being purchased by Block, formerly known as Square, uh, PayPal, and Zip. Now, um, you know, the CFPB said it's particularly concerned about how fast consumers of these buy now, pay later plans are accumulating debt and potentially overextending themselves. And to this end, I have to mention, just before we got on the podcast, I, I uh, was, you know, scanning my headlines and there was a story about danger, danger, buy now, pay later is going to, you know, trap you in debt. And it had some examples of people right. who had overextended <clears throat> themselves. Right. You know, and the uh, agency says it's concerned about also about how these companies harvest data about their customers. Right. Um, and the orders come as many in Congress has publicly called on the CFPB to look at these plans. Uh, both the House Financial Services Committee and a group of senators have sent letters to the CFPB asking them to look into this. But there's also a number of regulators in a number of other countries are looking at into uh, buy now, pay later. Um, as credit extended through these products skyrocket. There are investigations underway in Australia and the UK 
and the CFPB says it's coordinating its inquiry with regulators in those countries. Now, we've talked about this in the past, you know, buy now, pay later transactions have been growing like wildfire, especially um, with the large swing towards e-commerce shopping that commenced with the pandemic. This year, Americans are expected to make $100 million in purchases using buy now, pay later, up from $24 million last year, so a fourfold increase. Um, a firm reports that it has 8.7 million Americans uh, now using its buy now, pay later product, double the number recorded in 2020. And the online um, website Statista reports that 2% of all online sales this year have been buy now, pay later. Now, it's interesting that these two sets of CFPB orders are among the first major policy actions taken under the agency's newly confirmed director, Rohit Chopra. Uh, Chopra joined the um, CFPB from the Federal Trade Commission, where he led efforts to regulate big tech. So um, he said, quote, uh, the CFPB's inquiries will help inform regulators and policymakers about the future of our payment system. Uh, he later added that the inquiries build on his work at the FTC to, quote, shed light on the business practices of the largest tech companies in the world. Unsurprisingly, the banking industry has praised the CFPB's new focus on big tech. Uh, groups like the Consumer Bankers Association and the American Bankers Association have long argued that big tech firms have built their own sets of e-commerce and payments rails that operate outside the uh, regulatory structures around banking. And so, you know, it's that whole, uh, you know, encringing on the banking's uh, payments franchise. Uh, you know, clearly they want to see these guys regulated at least as much as they're being regulated. Right. And it looks like, you know, there may be some action in that in that direction. Wow. Yeah, good stuff. I, I think it is interesting to see how this all, you know, kind of develops. And I think I think that does impact our audience in a big way, too, because, sure. you know, as companies like Amazon and even Walmart and others, it's like in, in a lot of ways, I look at those companies as kind of the external uh, disruptors that our industry mm -hmm. doesn't seem to really understand the threat. Right. Um, I agree. But I think if as regulation comes in, in some ways, that's a benefit to us because, you know, it's going to keep them from really running wild with it and really starting to, to encroach as, as quickly encroach. as they would otherwise. Right, right. I agree. And, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, it's it it really is. It's you know, my fe my feeling is that that our industry is, is more closely aligned with the banks. Right. right. I mean, for obvious reasons, you have to have a bank sponsor to be selling right. merchant services anyway. Right. Um, so I think it really, you know, just behooves people to, to know that this is underfoot, you know, yeah. um, and it, there's stuff. probably going to be some kind of regulation of these guys. Yep. All right. Well, awesome. Well, Patty, thanks so much for the update. Sure thing. Thank you for listening to the Merchant Sales Podcast. Whether you are an industry veteran, processing executive, or just trying to learn about the payment space, we appreciate your time. The Merchant Sales Podcast is a joint production of Greensheet.com and CCSalesPro.com. And we hope you will tune in next week for more information and tips on building your merchant services business.